Pong from MaxPlug GCP in Bonn, and he's going to talk about bioarrangements of hyperplanes and polyxalone bite complexes. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So, I'm going to speak about uh, a subject that closely related to arrangements of hyperplanes. Uh, I want to, uh, first of all, apologize in advance because I'm not from the theory of arrangements in general. So, yeah, I'm sorry for the, the mistakes I will probably make about terminology or names or references. So, that's the first point. And the second point is please ask questions every time you're confused about something. Uh, yeah. So, here's the plan of my talk. So, first I will recall a few things about the classical theory of hyperplane arrangements and the oldic solomon algebra. And then I will try to restate these things in terms of, I mean, in the language of periods and try to motivate a generalization of arrangements of hyperplanes that I'm calling bioarrangements of hyperplanes. And uh, in the third part, I will introduce the main algebraic gadgets uh, of my talk, which I call the oldic solomon bicomplexes. Okay, so now the, the classical theory of arrangements uh, dates back to Arnold with the following question. So you take A, a finite set of hyperplanes in Cn. So for, for the first part of this talk, all hyperplanes will pass through the origin. And I will denote the, the hyperplane by the letters Ki. And we want to compute the Carmel ring of the complement Cn minus A. So here, just a, a short uh, an abuse of notation, so A either denotes the set of hyperplanes or the unions of the, the union of hyperplanes. And the first line is the set of hyperplanes, and the second line is the union of all hyperplanes viewed inside CN. And in all the talk, I will deal with cohomology groups with rational coefficients. Even though I mean, one can say more about uh, more general coefficients. And uh, so the motivation is from uh, group theory and more precisely uh, the theory of great groups. So if A is the so-called great arrangement, which is just the all all the diagonals in CN, so the hyperplane Z I and Z J, then it so happens that the cohomology ring of the complement is naturally isomorphic to the cohomology of the pure great group on N strength. So that was Arnold's uh, motivation. And um, the first thing to say about the cohomology algebra of the complement is that there are obvious elements in degree one in this cohomology algebra. And I want to note them by EI, and they will happen to be generators of the algebra. So if I choose a linear form FI for each hyperplane KI, then this gives me a map from CN minus the, the arrangements, the complement of the arrangement, to C minus zero. And this gives me a pullback in cohomology Fi star from h1 of c minus 0 to h1 of the complement of the arrangement. And the first Palmont group of c minus 0 is one dimensional, so if we choose a generator of this space, this group, then by pullback we have elements that are denoted by ei in the first cohomology group of the complement of the arrangement. So for each hyperplane, I have an element ei in the h1 of the complement. And Arnold conjectures that these, these elements, the classes EI, actually generate the cohomology algebra of uh, the complement. And this was proved to be true. And not only do they generate the cohomology algebra, but we also uh, know explicitly the relation, the, the ideal relations between these classes. And this led to the introduction of the oldic solomon algebra. So the oldic solomon algebra of the arrangement A, denoted by A, of A is a quotient of a certain exterior algebra on generators EI. So here, uh, the EIs are abstract elements, abstract variables, but in a minute they will correspond to the generators EI of the cohomology algebra. Um, so you take the, um, the exterior algebra on these EIs, so one for each hyperplane, and you have mod out by a certain ideal of relations. And there's one relation basically for each uh, set, for each dependent set of hyperplanes. So every time you take a certain number of dependent, a certain family of dependent hyperplanes in your arrangement, so I'm denoting them by ki1 to kir, then this gives you one relation in your uh, Oleg-Solomon algebra. 
and it's given by a certain differential d applied to the monomial corresponding to the family, so the monomial ei1 wedge, etc., wedge eir. And the differential is defined by this formula. It's a, it's a kind of classical formula, so the differential of a monomial is the alternating sum of the monomials where you uh, delete one of the generators at a time. Or another way to say it is that uh, d is the only derivation of the exterior algebra that sends every generator e i to the mm. So here it is. So that's the definition of the only Solomon algebra. Just an example, the, the smallest example of a non-trivial only Solomon algebra is the following. So I'm in C2, a two-dimensional affine space, and I look at three high three lines here, k1, k2, k3, that pass through points. And uh, here the only Solomon algebra of this arrangement is a quotient of an exterior algebra on three generators, e1, e2, e3. And there's actually only one relation here, which corresponds to the fact that k1, k2, and k3 are linearly dependent. And so I'm not out by d of the monomial e1, e2, e3, and d of this monomial is exactly e1, e2 minus e1, e3 plus e2, e3. So that's, that's an example of only solving algebra. And the main theorem in, in this business is that the only Solomon algebra of the arrangement is isomorphic as a gradient <coughs> algebra to the cohomology algebra of the complement of the arrangement. So the, the cohomology algebra, which is the logical invariant of the arrangement, is actually computed by a combinatorial invariant of the only Solomon algebra. So the, the thing that one has to notice is that the only Solomon algebra does not depend on the actual equations of the, uh, of the hyperplanes but only on the dependence relations between the hyperplane. So that's, that's what we call the, uh, the combinatorial invariant. Okay, and um, so I want to state a few properties of the only Solomon algebra that I, I think are important, especially uh, if, and when, I, when I will try to generalize to my arrangements. So the first, the first point I want to make is that the only Solomon algebra is uh, naturally endowed with a differential d, which is given by this formula here. So this, this formula here actually uh, defines a differential on the quotient on the oli solomon algebra. So the oli solomon algebra is actually a differential graded algebra, which is not too relevant if one thinks about this theorem because there's no uh, geometric uh, differential on the cohomology algebra. But here I want to view the oli solomon algebra as a differential grade algebra, that's really what it is. And the, 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 first, the first property, which I call the exactness, is that as a differential grade algebra, it's acyclic. So if you compute the cohomology, the homology groups of this Orly Solomon algebra, uh, then they're all zero. And that's something that's actually not difficult to prove from the definition, but it's an important point. The second property that I call localness is a little bit more subtle. Uh, so let's call S of A the set of strata of A. So a, a strata is a stratum is an intersection of a certain number of hyperplanes in the family. So either a hyperplane or uh, an intersection of two hyperplanes or three hyperplanes and so on. And I'm creating the set of strata of my arrangement by the codimension. Um, I'm denoting by S R of A the set of strata of codimension R. So S zero of A is only the ambient space CN. S1 of A is just a set of hyperplanes. S2 of A is the set of um, intersection of two distinct hyperplanes and so on. And there's actually a, a decomposition of the Olic Solomon algebra as a direct sum indexed by the strata. So the degree R part of the Olic Solomon algebra emits direct sum decomposition indexed by the strata of codimension R. And I'm denoting by ARS of the arrangement, the direct sum corresponding to a straight in S. And if you want to know what, what that is, it's simply the subspace, the subgroup of the only sum of algebra spanned by the monomials EI1, wedge EI2, etc., corresponding to an intersection, the geometric intersection KI1 intersected with KI2, etc., equal to the straight sum that we started with. And it's also not difficult to prove this property starting with the, the definition of the only sum algebra, but it's actually a, 
something that I find is important. And I'm calling this a local nest property because um, because basically the the S local part, ARS, so I'm calling it the S local part of the Olin Solomon algebra, only depends, if you think about it, only depends on the hyperplanes that contain uh, the stratum S. So it's kind of it's kind of local uh, local around us. Um, another way of saying this is that it's an invariant, it's a combinatorial invariant of the subarrangements uh, consisting of the hyperplanes that contain the, the stratum S. So in a, in, a, in a sense, the only sum in algebra is a direct sum of local parts uh, corresponding to all the stratum. And these two properties, exactness and localness, in some sense characterize the olic solomon algebra in a, in a precise sense. And the precise sense is the, is the following. So I, I can give out of these two properties an inductive definition of the olic solomon algebra, the sort of universal property. So if you don't, re, if you don't remember the definition with the, the quotient of an exterior algebra and so on, then there's a sort of universal property of the olic solomon algebra that goes as, as follows. So you can define the olic solomon algebra together with the differential, which is a very important datum, by induction on the degree. So you start with degree 0. A0 is just the base field Q. And so now suppose that we have defined um, the olic solomon algebra up to degree R minus 1, and we want to define the degree R part of the olic solomon algebra. Then I I'm going to define each local part corresponding to strata. So if I take a stratum sigma of could I mention R, and I want to define the sigma local part AR sigma of the, of the arrangement, I'm going to define it as a kernel of a previously defined differential. So here I'm working, so to speak, locally on sigma, which means that I'm looking only at, at strata that contain sigma. So for the strata that have um, Dimension, the dimension of sigma plus 1, the strata S, I have defined their, uh, their the corresponding direct summons in the only summon algebra. I have also defined the direct summons corresponding to strata T, which have dimension uh, 2 more. And there's a differential that goes from the S local parts to the T local parts of the only summon algebra. And I'm defining the sigma local part, AR sigma, as the kernel of this map. And I'm defining the, the differential D as just the, the inclusion natural <coughs> And if you, I mean, if you think about it, this, is, this has to be true because if you look at this, uh, the sequence of so AR sigma, direct sum of the AR minus 1 S, so for S containing sigma, a R minus two T. And then you continue, you continue, you have so th these are the differentials. So you look at straight a U, could I mention R minus three and so on? And you go on. This is actually so this this big complex is actually itself an Olic Solomon algebra. This is the Olic Solomon algebra of what I call the, the, the sigma <coughs> local part of the, of the arrangement, that is uh, the arrangement corresponding to uh, hyperplanes, so the arrangement consisting of hyperplanes that contain sigma. So by, by my first property, by the exactness property, this has to be an exact uh, complex. So in particular, this, this sigma local part has to be the kernel of some previously defined differential. Okay? So that gives, that gives us a, a way of inductively defining all the, all the local parts of the, the olic solomon algebra together with the differential uh, by induction on the, on the, on the co-dimension. And here, the, the point that I want to, to make is that um, if, I, if I continue this complex, it's still exact, which is a sort of miracle to think about. It. Because you only, you only uh, require exactness here, but I mean the rest of the complex is also exact. That's, 
but in, in a few minutes, that's, there's going to be a, an important difference with this fact. OK, so now I want to restate these physical <coughs> results in the language of periods. So now I'm going to do algebraic geometry over Q. So just maybe just for the slide, I'm going to imagine that my arrangement is defined over Q, which means that I can choose linear forms defining my hyperplanes with rational coefficients. And there are at least two ways of making sense of cohomology groups in that setting. So there's the algebraic Dirac cohomology group groups of, of the complement. So here, what I mean by algebraic Dirac cohomology, it's in the sense of a Grotenleek. It means that it, it's exactly the same as the smooth, the classical Dirac cohomology groups with smooth differential forms, except that here, I only allow algebraic differential forms with rational coefficients which makes sense because uh, the arrangement is defined over the rational. And uh, so Grotenleek showed that these things are well defined and that they define uh, Q vector spaces which have finite dimension and which satisfy a whole bunch of, all, all kinds of properties of, of cohomology <coughs> theory. But that's what I call the algebraic Durham cohomology. So it's basically differential forms with, uh, algebraic differential forms with rational coefficients. And there's a more classical object probably for a topologist, which is the, what algebraic geometers call the Betty cohomology and what the rest of the world calls the singular cohomology, uh, which is just the, the singular cohomology of the components. Of the, so you take the C points, the complex points of, of the, of the complement, and you look at the singular mm -hmm. cohomology. Mm -hmm. And this also defines uh, finite dimensional Q vector spaces. So there are two ways of computing cohomology. And it so happens that these, these vector spaces, the Durham vector spaces and the Betsy vector spaces actually have the same dimension. And, uh, but the sum point is that they're not canonically isomorphic. So there's no canonical isomorphism between these two uh, cohomology theorems. But if you extend the scalars to the complex numbers, there is. So there's the so-called period isomorphism between these two uh, cohomology theories tensored by C. So you can now complexify all, all the vector spaces, and there's a canonical natural isomorphism that's factorial um, between the Duran <coughs> cohomology and the Betty cohomology. And how is this defined? It's simply taking algebraic differential forms on your space and integrated, integrating them over cycles, over topological cycles in, in your space. And that gives you complex numbers. And if you put, uh, if you choose, for instance, a basis of the Dirac cohomology group and a basis of the Betty homology group, the, the dual of the, of the cohomology group, then you can compute a certain number of integrals, and these give you complex numbers. And if you put complex, these complex numbers in, in a matrix, then the content of, of this isomorphism is that you will have a square matrix with complex coefficients, which is invertible, and which is called a period matrix. And all the elements in this matrix are some integrals of, of some algebraic differential forms on some cycles of the variety. And this makes sense for every smooth algebraic variety over, over Q. And in general, you get a, a lot of interesting numbers, like elliptic integrals and stuff. Mm -hmm. And here, if I, if I specialize uh, to complements of hyperplane arrangements, yes. one can see a little bit more. So a reformulation of part of the results that I was mentioning is that the cohomology algebra of the complement of the arrangement is actually generated in degree one by a certain number of copies of the H1 of uh, the affine line minus zero. So it's just a reformulation of what I said. So the, the k copies of H1 of A1 minus zero are exactly the generators EI in my previous slides. And there's a subjective map from the exterior algebra on, on these generators to the, onto the cohomology range of the complement. And here I did not say if I mean the Rand cohomology or the T cohomology, and it's on purpose because this this subjective map is valid in every cohomology theory, so it's motivic, so to speak, that, that makes sense. Um, which means in my setting that it's true in the Durham setting, it's true in the Betty setting, and it's the, these two maps are compatible with the period isomorphism. So in a sense, if you want to understand the period matrix of the complement of an arrangement, 
then you only need to understand the period matrix of H1 of the alpha 9 minus 0. And this matrix is actually very simple. If I look at H1 to the Durham version of H1 of A1 minus 0, is one dimensional. And a, a sort of canonical generator is the class of the form dz over z, which is an algebraic differential form, which is closed, but which is not the differential of any function because we don't have a logarithm. And if you look at the Betsy cohomology, so more precisely the dual, because we're um, we like homology, singular homology. So this is just the homology of C star and a natural generator. So this is also one dimensional a natural generator is a small loop gamma around zero like that. Small set loop. And so I have the, the, the period matrix of A1 minus 0 is just a one by one matrix with just one complex coefficient. And the, this coefficient is exactly the pairing between the, this simple cycle and the form dz over z. So it's just the integral of dz over z on gamma. And this is just 2i pi. So this is what you get. And the consequence of this subjection is that the periods of uh, the hyperplane arrangements complement are all polynomials in 2i pi with rational coefficients. So that's all you can get. In your period matrix, you will only get um, polynomials in 2i pi. And, okay, so the conclusion is that in, in the motivic sense, in, in, the, in terms of periods, these, these cohomology groups are not so interesting. They're, we understand them all if we understand just this, this guy here, h1 of a1 minus and uh, so my, my personal motivation for studying hyperplane arrangements come, I actually comes from more interesting periods, more interesting numbers that appear in matrix periods, uh, period matrices, sorry. And uh, I have just, so I don't want to go into too many details about them, but one uh, quite popular family of such periods is the so-called family of multiple zeta values. So you start with, uh, the values of the Riemann zeta function at integers, so zeta of n is the, given by the, the sum of the inverses of the nth powers of all integers. And there's a generalization that's due to Euler, which is called multiple zeta values, which depend on a certain tuple of integers, n1, n2, etc. And it's given by the following sum. Uh, you sum over increasing indices k1, k2, k3, and you sum the inverse of k1 to n1, k2 to the n2, and so on. And these numbers have very interesting algebraic properties, so they satisfy interesting relations. Um, they are very interesting in terms of algebraic geometry, of arithmetics, they appear in physics, and yeah, so in the last 20 or 30 years, they have been studied by a lot of people uh, through a lot of different uh, approaches. And these numbers and other, other families of numbers are my motivation to to understand, uh, to to go into into the study of hyperplane arrangements, and what's the relation between these numbers and hyperplane arrangements? So I'm going to try and explain that in the next slide. I'm just going to do the example of zeta of two, and you will have to believe me that um, it it works in in, in generality, in more generally for all multiple zeta values, for instance. And this is well explained in the article by Gonshrop and Manning. Uh, so of course I know that, that zeta of two is, is pi, pi square over six, so it's also a polynomial in, in two i pi with rational coefficients, but it's just the only uh, example that I can do in two dimensions. So you'll just have to trust me. So zeta of two is, is the inverse of the squares of the integers, and it, the, the important point is that it has an integral representation. It's given by this following integral, so you integrate dx dy over one minus x times y on the standard triangle, 0 less than x less than y less than 1. If you want to convince yourself uh, that this formula is correct, you just have to write 1 over 1 minus x as a geometric series, expand it, and integrate with respect to x, then with respect to y, then you get the formula easy. Um, and now, let me draw a picture of what's going on geometrically. So, here this is a picture of the projective plane. So in particular, the, there's the, the line at infinity, which is the sort of circle over there in blue. 
And in blue, uh, I have drawn, I have pictured the poles of the differential form that I'm integrating. So there's the line of infinity, where the differential form is not defined. And then there are two lines where the denominator vanishes. So there's the line x equals 1, which is this line here, the vertical line, the blue line, and y equals 0, which is this, this line here. So it's clear. Uh, and in red, I have pictured the boundary of the integration domain. So the integration domain is bounded by three lines, so x equals 0, this vertical red line here, x equals y, which is the, the diagonal here, and y equals 1, the horizontal red line. So this is basically the, the geometric configuration that, that we see. And uh, there are four triple points on this configuration. Two that, are, that I have pictured in red because basically they are intersection of two red lines and two that I have pictured in blue because they are intersections of two blue lines. And uh, one natural thing to do in algebraic geometry is to blow up these four points to get to a normal crossing configuration. So I'm, I, I'm replacing each point by a sort of by a P1, which corresponds to all the normal directions to this point. And I have now two blue P1s, two blue exceptional divisors uh, that correspond to my two blue points, and two red exceptional divisors that correspond to my two red points. And so I started in P2. I started in P2 with uh, six lines, so three blue and three red. And now I'm in a space that's a little bit stranger than P2. It's blown up of P2. So I'm denoting it by P2 tilde. And in P2 tilde, I have normal crossing divisors. And there are five irreducible components that I have pictured in blue and five others that I have pictured in red. And I'm calling L tilde the union of the five blue divisors, blue lines, and M tilde the union <coughs> of the five red lines. And, uh, and one thing that we can do, so we, <coughs> we had computed zeta of 2 as a, as a certain integral, so let me rewrite this as integral of certain form omega and delta, where omega is the dx dy over 1 minus xy, and delta is the triangle, the shaded triangle here in red. And because pi is a birational transformation, you only change some the, the space P2 in, uh, in parts of uh, measure 0. So we can still compute the integral on this P2 tilde space. So just have to pull back the form omega to the space. And you integrate on pi minus 1 of delta. So pi minus 1 of delta is this shaded sort of <coughs> pentagon, pentagon shaped uh, thing here. And it's, it's probably a silly thing to do the first time you see it. I mean, you have an, a, a simple integral on P2, and you, you, you blow things up, and you don't really understand what you're doing. And then you transform it into an, an integral over a pentagon, which seems more complicated. It's, a, it's actually what you want to do. And the, the end of the story is that <coughs> you want to understand the cohomology group H, which is a relative cohomology group H2 of P2 tilde minus L tilde relative <coughs> to M tilde. So I'm, I'm in this blown up space P2 tilde, and I'm looking at P2 tilde minus all the blue stuff, and I'm taking that relative to all the red stuff. <coughs> so that, that probably looks strange, but it's actually the, the answer that we need. Uh, so my point is that zeta of 2 is a period of this cohomology group. Why is that? Well, if you look at the, the Durham version of H, so H Durham, inside H Durham, there is the class of or at least you have to believe me on this. There's the class of pi star of omega, the differential form that we're integrating. You only have to, to check that um, when you when you pull back omega to p tilde, it only gains uh, poles on the two blue exceptional divisors. And uh, on the Betty side of the story, so the singular cohomology, or more uh, precisely the homology, so I'm dualizing this, I'm looking at the singular homology, then this pentagon here, pi minus 1 of delta, defines a class in the homology group. Because precisely, it's, uh, it lives in my space P2 tilde minus L tilde, and its boundary is on M tilde. So that's the definition of uh, relative homology. And this is, so yeah, and, and now, 
Well, now, by definition, that the pairing of these two classes via the period isomorphism is exactly this integral, which is zeta of 2. So I've managed to write zeta of 2 to, to view zeta of 2 inside a period matrix. And what you can do with zeta of 2, you can do with all multiple zeta values and many more integrals. Um, yeah, I just want to, to make a point that's probably not uh, clear. So when we've done all this, one could argue that we didn't have to, to do this complicated blow up. So the question is, why not, uh, why not look at just H2 of P2 minus the blue stuff relative to the red stuff? So work in P2 and not in this P2 tilde. Uh, this is because this is because of these of these two red points here, basically. So if you look, if you work in P2 minus L, then you open you open this triangle. And then this triangle does not define um, a class in the homology, in the relative homology. So you, you sort of have to uh, separate, the light motive is, is to separate the poles of the differential form and the boundary of the integration domain. And that's what you, that's what you do by blowing it. So, so this, this is the wrong answer, so to speak. This is, in, in the period matrix of, of this thing, there's no data of two. So we really have to do this below. Okay, so I hope this motivates the following definition. So I'm, I'm defining a bi-arrangement of high planes to be a triple L and chi, where, so L is, so there's, there's this color code blue and, and red. It's, it's parallel to the color code in, in the previous slide. L is a set of high planes in Pn. So I'm working in Pn, but I could also do it in, in Cn. It's just more symmetric in, in the projective space. L is a finite set of hyperplanes in Pn, so blue hyperplanes. M is a set of red hyperplanes in Pn. So they're living in the same space, but they don't necessarily have the same number of, of hyperplanes. And the subtle part of the definition is this. So chi is a, what I call a coloring function. So it's a function on the set of straights of L union M. So this means all possible multiple intersections of red and blue hyperplates. So this is all, this means all, all straights of the geometric configuration. Into a two set elements, lambda or mu. So lambda stands for um, blue and mu stands for red. Uh, so to each stratum, I assign a color of blue or red, such that, of course, the color of a blue hyperplane is blue and the color of a red hyperplane is red. And there's also a technical condition that I don't want to, to state here, but uh, it's, yeah, it's not so important. So basically, what, what is the bi-arrangement of hyperplanes? You have a bunch of hyperplanes in PN, and you decide that some are blue and some are red. But you also give a color to the intersection of two hyperplanes, three hyperplanes, and so on. So you color everything. And what I call the motive of the bi-arrangement of hyperplanes is the collection of relative cohomology groups of the following form. <coughs> so here I'm just uh, I will try to define this just in a sentence. So you start with Pn with your geometric configuration. It's not necessarily uh, a normal crossing divisor, so you first resolve the singularities by doing uh, some blow-ups. So that's what some people may call a wonderful compactification. And, uh, and you call Pn tilde the, the blown-up space. And in Pn tilde, you have a normal crossing divisor. But you have added a lot of exceptional divisor in, in, in the process. And some of them you have added because you have blown up a blue stratum. Remember that there's a color attached to each stratum. So there are exceptional divisors that correspond to the blow up of a blue stratum and some exceptional divisors that correspond to the blow up of a red stratum. And you decide that the exceptional divisors get colors uh, correspondingly. Okay, so you have blue, ex blue exceptional divisors and red exceptional divisors uh, corresponding to the blow up of blue and red stratum. Sorry, what happens if the uh, two blue line and two red line intersect in the same uh, point, for instance? Uh, yeah, I will, I will get to it in a, in a second. Yeah. I will come back to my example. Before. Thank you. Um, so anyway, in, in this in this PN tilde, you have an, uh, 
you have a, a normal crossing divisor with blue um, irreducible components and red irreducible components. L tilde is the union of blue components. M tilde is the union of the red components. And you look at this relative to a homogeneous group. So it's exactly as in the previous slide, P and tilde minus all the blue stuff relative to all the white stuff. And the point is that these Carmont groups are very rich in terms of periods. So if you write down the period matrices of these Carmont groups, then you will get, of course, two i pi's and all, yeah, polyomials and two i pi, but also zeta values, multiple zeta values, uh, logarithms of uh, rational numbers, uh, values of polylogarithms, and all these kinds of very interesting numbers. So these are the these are the Carmont groups that I want to get study. Uh, so first example is that arrangements of hyperplanes are special cases of bi-arrangements. So if you take your configuration of hyperplanes and you color everything in blue, then you have added nothing and you just have an arrangement of hyperplanes. And if you think about it, the corresponding motive is just the cohomology of the complement of the hyperplanes. So it's all the it's all classical. The second example is the bi-arrangement of hyperplanes corresponding to zeta of two of the previous slide, so let's have a look at the previous slide again. So I have six lines in P2, and I have three red lines and three blue lines. And here, the, the, the four points correspond to the coloring function. So I have colored these two points in blue and these two points in red, and there are uh, a few, <coughs> uh, there are a few points that I, have, that I haven't colored, but it's just because um, the final result will not depend on the coloring that I choose on these points. Um, and not to so not to answer uh, your question, I could decide that this point is blue. I mean, this is this is totally acceptable in the definition. I can decide that this point is blue or this point is red. Um, it would just not make sense in terms of geometry because if I want uh, this. Uh, period matrix argument to work, I have to color it that way, but it's better to have more freedom than, than less, so I, I, can, I can decide that this point is blue. And if I have uh, two blue lines intersecting at the same point as two red lines, then you have to choose. You just have to choose. And, and the, the construction work anyway. Sorry? The construction work anyway. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, in the definition and in the rest of the, the things that I will present in, in the talk, there's, yeah, you have, you have this freedom. <laughs> not, not all choices of coloring are relevant in terms of, uh, let's say, arithmetics, but for many purposes, it's better to have the freedom to color the way you want. Uh, and the, the last remark is that there's a, an asymptotic solution in the world of bi-arrangements, which basically, uh, which is nothing but interchanging the colors blue and red. And if you interchange the colors blue and red, it corresponds in terms of relative cohomology groups to Poincaré duality. So, so in, in particular, you have you not only have arrangements of hyperplanes where everything's blue, you have what one could call co-arrangements of hyperplanes where everything's red. So, you know, like empty set A mu. So you color everything in red, and the motive corresponding to this. Is just uh, the relative cohomology of Pn relative to the arrangement. That's just what it is. So, so in, in this in this world of by arrangements, you have the complements of, of hyperplane arrangements, and you have also the, these dual dual things. And it's nice to have a duality if you think in terms of in I don't know constructible sheets or perverse sheets. It's it's a very interesting feature to have this. Anyway, so um, so I want to compute these relative cohomology groups, and I'm going to to do that by introducing a generalization of the Ollison algebras, and I'm calling them the Ollison bicomplexes. So it, it's going to look like this. So they're going to be. So I, I start with I fix a by arrangement L and chi, and I'm going to construct a bicomplex A. It's going to look like this. So there's a horizontal differential prime that decreases the first index by one 
and there's a vertical differential d double prime that increases the second index by one. So it's, it's sort of a mixture between cohomological and homological conventions. Um, and to define these oldic solomon like complexes, I'm going to mimic the inductive definition of the oldic solomon algebra. In particular, the every every uh, part of this oldic solomon like complex will be a direct sum indexed by strata. So the part of by degree i j will have a direct a direct sum indexed by the strata of could I mention i plus j. Um, and I'm going to define them by induction on the Kuda mutual, exactly as in the classical case. So in, in, in this corner, A0, 0, zero will correspond to the, the total space, the ambient space, that's going to be the base step of my induction. And then out of Kuda mutual 1, straight out, I'm going to define this uh, sort of diagonal. And then these three groups out of Kuda mutual 2, uh, straight out, etc. And how does this work? So the base step of the induction is just to put a0 zero, zero equals q in the top right corner over there. <coughs> and then if I have defined all the, uh, all the local parts up to codimension r minus 1, I want to know how to define the, uh, the local parts for codimension r strata. And it's going to depend on the color of the strata. So if the strata is blue, if it's a blue strata, so if, if the coloring chi is lambda, then it's going to work exactly as in the classical case. I'm going to define the sigma local part as a kernel of a previously defined uh, differential. So here uh, I'm looking at uh, a horizontal differential d prime. And there's, there are the, the local parts corresponding to straight to s of dimension one more. And there's a horizontal differential going to the local parts corresponding to straight to t of dimension two more. And I'm defining the sigma local part as the kernel of this differential. Okay. And dually, if the stratum is red, I'm going to define the, the corresponding part in the only solomon bi complex as a co-kernel. So this, this, should, this should, be, should be vertical. So E double prime are vertical. So I have the, the, the T local part, the S local part, and then the sigma local part is a co-kernel. So in my, my picture here, so I'm, I'm working, if for blue straight, uh, I'm taking kernels in this direction, and for red straight, uh, I'm taking co-kernels in that direction. And uh, it's, an, it's an easy exercise in homological algebra to see that these two things actually um, define, define a bicomplex. And I call this the oldic solomon bicomplex of the bi-range. <laughs> Now you, you remember that in the classical case, I was imposing uh, some exactness property uh, on the on, on the far left, but that the rest of the complex was also uh, was also exact, which was sort of a miracle. And here, this miracle does not happen all the time, but it's it's very important that it happens. So I want to give a name to this, and I'm going to call. The bar range with the five planes exact if the above exact sequence, so there's the two, two exact sequences here, can be continued to long exact sequences. So if I, so basically I, I'm on my bi complex and I have the sigma local part, and I'm asking that, so I have defined it so that it starts a, a, an exact sequence, and I'm asking that the rest of the, of the row is still exact. Yes. I have to see if I'm following you. It's not exact because uh, some of the things inside of the column, inside of the arrangement, can change color. Uh, yeah, it's big, it's big, it's big. So I, I don't have um, a very satisfying answer of what makes things not exact. But basically, if you think in terms of homological algebra, you take kernels and then the co-kernels and then kernels, and after three steps, you completely lost and you completely lost the, the exactness properties. So, I mean, it's easy to give examples of things that are not exact. It's, it's, in terms of homological algebra, it's really a mess. Uh, but I will be mainly interested in, in, in the things that are exact. And so, yeah, so for blue straight, I'm asking for 
all rows to be exact, and for red strays, I'm asking for all columns to be exact. Example, all arrangements of hyperplanes are exact, of course, by, by the, the remark that I just, just made. And in this case, we recover, by definition, the, the all examined algebras. So you only start with A0 in the, in the top right corner, and you only take kernels, so you end up with something just on the, on the first row of your bicomplex, and this is just the all examined algebra with this differential. And there's also uh, there's a, there's a few interesting features of, for exact by arrangements. My point, for instance, there's a deletion and restriction formalism for exact by arrangements that doesn't work at all for non exact by arrangements. Uh, and you can you can prove exactness of by arrangements by induction. Uh, so if if the deletion and the restriction are exact, then the arrangement is exact. And these these kinds of things. Um, my my intuition is that. Exact by arrangements are the right generalization of arrangements. So there's, they're the one that are well behaved in some, in some sense. Yes. So is your example with zeta 2 of exact? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so the theorem is that for exact by arrangements of hyperplanes, there's an analog of the least called only Solomon theorem for these relative cohomology groups. So in some sense, the only Solomon bicomplex, which is, so I haven't made the, 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 that point already, but it's it's a combinatorial invariant of the of the by arrangement. It computes the, the motive, computes the relative cohomology groups. So more precisely what this what does this mean? So for each each integer k between zero and the and the dimension, so I have Okay, I'll draw a picture. <coughs> so I'm going to extract information of my out of my double complex in the following way. So I have, I have my only sum and bi complex here that I define inductively, and for so it, yeah, it goes from zero to n here, n here, and. For a certain k, I'm going to look at, at, the, fo at the following uh, rectangle inside, inside, inside the bicomplex. So this is k and n minus k here. So this is a bicomplex. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a bicomplex. And I'm, I'm, I'm writing k inside brackets a for the total complex of this complex. And then my claim is that the, the homology group the homology groups of this complex compute some parts of the relative cohomology groups. More precisely, I have a weight filtration W on, on the on the cohomology groups, the relative cohomology groups that comes from mixed Hopf theory. So that it's an increasing filtration indexed by um, even integers. So I have W0, W2, W4, it goes up to W2n. And um, and what I can compute is actually the the successive quotients of this wave filtration, and these are computed by some homology groups of of these uh, rectangles. Okay. So it doesn't really matter what the precise formulas are, but there's a there's a clear combinatorial recipe to compute the the weights rate quotients out of the only uh by complex. And uh, so this is, this is the theorem, and of course it's it's a generalization of the classical Poisson Lorentz Solomon theorem in the in the case of arrangements. So in the case of arrangements, I only have a row here, and what I'm saying is that uh, so first of all, in the classical case, there's only one weight. So for the H K in degree K, there's only weight two K, which is a great difference with the the relative cohomology. And uh, and I'm just saying that the H K is computed by the by a certain kernel of the of the differential in the only solid algebra, which is just a projected version of the of the theorem that I mentioned earlier. So this uh, mix of structure is not pure anymore. No, not at all. Yeah. So yeah, that's that, that's another formulation of of the difference between the the, the classical case and the relative cohomology case. In the classical case, we have 
pure hot structures. There's only one weight in each uh, Carmel group, and here they are really mixed. So you have in general uh, all these all these weights, uh, and and uh, this is an important point because here the weight grade quotients are computed by a combinatorial formula. So they are combinatorial invariance of the by arrangements, but there's no way of making sense of the fact that the motive itself, the relative Carmel group, is a combinatorial invariance. Precisely because the, uh, the extension data between these uh, weight grade quotients contain a lot of arithmetic information, such as the integrals that, are, that I, that I uh, mentioned. And if you, if you start with the integral of data of 2, uh, the, the picture on, 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 on the previous slide, and you slightly move a hyperplane, then the integral is going to change. Okay, obviously. So, and and this integral is part of the of the extension data between the weights. Right? So it's um, so there's no way that the whole model is a combinatorial invariant, and that's precisely. Uh, I mean, the only combinatorial thing that I can extract that we can extract from from these things are the grade the grade pieces. Okay. Uh, now I want to mention that one can do explicit computations with these things because up to up, up to now um, the definitions have been quite abstract. So I have to find all the by complexes by induction. So it's relatively hard to to understand what they what they are. Uh, for certain by arrangements, uh, we can actually make very explicit computations in um, exactly as in the in the classical case. So I have a combinatorial notion of Tame by arrangements of hyperplanes. I don't want to uh, say what that means, but it's a combinatorial notion which is uh, totally explicit. It's not inductive or anything. It's just uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just an explicit combinatorial uh, notion on the on, on the by arrangement. And I want to mention that generic by arrangements are tame. So tameness is a sort of genericity condition, and uh, tame by arrangements are all exact. So, thanks to this, I can produce a lot of examples of exact by arrangements and show that uh, this, uh, the, the definition of an exact by arrangement is, is absolutely not empty. And actually, many, many uh, natural arrangements, by arrangements, are exact. And the proposition is that for tame by arrangements, I can produce an explicit um, presentation of the Olic Solomon by complex as a sub quotient of. Uh, the tensor product of the oling solomon algebra of the first arrangement and the dual of the oling solomon algebra of the second arrangement. And yeah, the relations are, are explicit. So just to give you a, the only uh, explicit example of an oling solomon bicomplex in this talk, but I mean, I could produce uh, dozens of them. For this uh, example, so I have three lines that meet at a point, and two are blue, one is red, and I'm coloring the point blue, which is the reasonable thing to do, but it could be red, it wouldn't matter. And I'm claiming that in this, if I apply my proposition to this example, so this example is attained by arrangement, hence it's exact, and it's all its Solomon bicomplex, it's the quotient of the, the tensor product of two exterior algebra, algebra, so one exterior algebra on the blue hyperplanes, E1, E2, and the dual of the exterior algebra on the red hat plane f1 the dual. And the only relation that comes from this uh, degeneracy is the fact that the differential applied to e1 with e2 tensor f1 dual is zero. So they, I mean, the relations in, in this proposition really look like the usual relations in the Olig Solomon algebra. So they, they really look like something uh, like d of, d of a certain monomial tensor another monomial equals zero. And the light motive is that every time I have a bad, a, a bad stratum that's blue, it's going to give a relation of approximately of this form. And every time I have, so dually, every time I have a bad stratum that's red, it's going to give me a correlation of the dual form. So it's, of course, it's a little bit more intricate because it's a sub quotient, and sub quotients are uh, difficult to work with, but that's. That's the way it, it works. An example, 
just to, to see that all this, all this is not empty. So one can define multiple data by arrangements in the same way as what I did with data of two, and they're all tin. So we can so they're all exact. So the theorem applies, and we and we can also compute explicitly the the all sovereign by complexes and hence all the weight varied parts of the modules. That's that's the kind of application that I have in mind. Okay, in, in the last uh, two minutes, I want I just want to mention that there's a global version of all of these theorems. So now, if I don't want to work in PN, but uh, in some other space, in a complex manifold X, I can define by arrangements of hypersurfaces. It's exactly as by arrangements of hyperplanes, except that hyperplanes are replaced by smooth hypersurfaces. And the, I'm asking that they just intersect uh, uh, locally like, like hyperplanes. So locally, in local charts on X, uh, what, I, what I get is an arrangement of hyperplanes. And I also have a coloring function and all. So it's just, yeah, just a different uh, by arrangements in different charts. And uh, it's, it's actually, uh, so the, the, the theorem is, is the, the general theorem is the following. So one can compute the corresponding motives by a spectral sequence that um, mixes the combinatorial parts of the story. So these are all the Solomon bicomplexes that I compute in local charts on my on my manifold X. And you have to also incorporate geometric data and specifically the um, the Carmage groups of all straight lines. And I have a in this in this situation you have a spectral sequence that computes the um, the cohomology, the relative cohomology of the bi-arrangement. And uh, if you if X is an algebraic variety and all the L and M are algebraic divisors, then everything is compatible with mixed mm -hmm. structures. And if you apply this to PN and arrangements of hyperplanes, you recover the first here. And there could be many applications of this global setting. I'm just thinking about one for now, which is toric arrangements. So I'm looking at, let's say, CN or C star N. And I'm looking at complex tori. And um, they could be interesting uh, because many, many integrals that appear in, in this business of multiple zetas and other stuff have uh, toric, toric forms. So for instance, so basically, if you, if you take the, the formula that I gave for zeta of 2 of, and you make a, I'm not going to write it, you make a, an easy chain of variables, you get this kind of thing. So it's, it's, uh, it looks like this. And you have the hypercube. Now you integrate over hypercube, and you have a sort of hyperbola somewhere. So this, the hypercube is red, and the hyperbola is, is blue. And this is uh, an arrangement of hypersurfaces in, in, in C2. And uh, yes, yeah, so that could be an application of, of these ideas. And just as conclusion, I want to mention open problems, which are uh, mainly combinatorial. And uh, I hope that there are people in this room that will be interested in, in looking at them. So one open problem is a simple combinatorial condition for the exactness of a So I have a sufficient condition, which I can tame this. But I don't fully understand uh, what, what, is, what it means for a bi-arrangement to be exact. It doesn't make sense for now. Um, so I want also an explicit description of the olic bicomplexes bi-complexes for all exact bi-arrangements. I'm not, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything uh, apart from the same case, which is still uh, interesting. And we see bases, so in, in the theory of all the algebras, there are <coughs> natural bases called NBC bases that depend on uh, linear order in the hyperplanes. And I'm guessing that there should be uh, some similar uh, statement for all the solvent bicomplexes. Well, it's, it, it has to be more complicated because it's not a quotient, it's a sub-quotient of, of a mixture algebra, so one would have to make more choices probably, but open question. Uh, another interesting thing is to study oli solomon bicomplexes as modules over the oli solomon algebra. So I was, I was telling you that um, in, many, in many examples, the oli solomon bicomplex is something that you get out of um, 
the tensor product of an orthogonal algebra and the dual of another orthogonal algebra. In many situations, you will get the orthogonal bi complex as a module over the, the first or the second orthogonal algebra. And there are probably uh, very interesting uh, questions of homological algebra uh, about, about this thing. In, in particular, my, my intuition about all these bi complexes is that they sort of form uh, morphisms between all these algebras. I mean, not in the technical sense, but if you look at an all these bi complex, there's the all these algebra of the first arrangement here, and, and there the, there's a dual of the all these algebra of the second. Um, second arrangement, and in the middle there are uh, a lot of other groups that explain how these two uh, arrangements interact together. It's in the same same vein. And uh, yeah, homological properties of all the bicomplexes, uh, I've already mentioned that. If I if I view them as modules of all the solving algebras, one can ask questions about cross relating things like that. So that's the kind of question that I hope people will be interested in. I'm going to stop here. Questions, comments? So uh, I understand that covering of high planes is very important. It's an initial problem. Yes. It's a demo, which is not a hell, whatever. But uh, you, you covered also some intersections. Does it uh, use anywhere? Sir? Is it used in your computation? So, so yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe I did. Do the results change if you color differently? So, so basically, here uh, the the coloring of, of the of the strata is implicit in this in this notation. Uh, the coloring of the strata will give the coloring of the exceptional divisors here. Yeah. And if you change the coloring of the exceptional divisors, the the, the relative cohomology group will change. It will it will be absolutely different, and so so all I mean all colors have have an impact in, in the final result. So uh, yeah. you said it doesn't matter how the color points. So it doesn't matter it changes the result. No, what I, what I wait, what I, what I was trying to say is that there are some points for which the coloring does not matter. So for instance, this point could be colored blue or red. It, it wouldn't it wouldn't change the yeah. So basically, the, so the, the statement is that the only colors that count are the colors of the so-called irreducible strata. But it, it's important. So you color differently, you get different values. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So for instance, if I do stupid colorings here, like if I color these, these two points blue, yeah, then in, in the period matrix, I, I will not get zeta two. I will get totally different period matrix. If you go to the next to last slide, please. Um, <coughs> so this spectral sequence, the E1 page is a model for the complement of the arrangement, let's say when you have a single coloring. Oh, when you have, oh, for, for, uh, for just one arrangement? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so if, 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 you, if you take this for just one arrangement, uh, you recover a, a result that I learned in an article of uh, Loyenga in the 90s, uh, which was also um, uh, recast in, in, in another context by, by Chris and Bibi and uh, also by myself in another different context. Um, and in, the, in this setting, it's a, it's a model. Yeah. In this setting, it's a model. But in general, uh, it's still a model? Or what is it? So, so sorry. It's a model if uh, if X is a is a smooth projective variety. Uh, but um, in general, so in general, if X is a smooth projective variety, then you will get uh, uh, then you will get the, the, the generation of the spectral sequence. So the E two term will actually be the the weight rate part. But uh, I wouldn't know what it would mean for it to be a model. You understand? You're looking at relative cohomology. You don't have an algebra, natural algebra structure here. Well, there's no algebra structure here, so I, I don't know. So that's in the absolute case, right? Yeah, in the absolute case, you can see more. So there's an algebra structure, and it's, a, it's actually a model in terms of, uh, in, in the sense of rational homotopy here. But here, I wouldn't know what, what it would mean for it to be a model. Okay, and maybe on the last page, you say something about causality. So if the complement is 
Khazul, can you talk about this as a Khazul module, module of this Khazul algebra? I have no idea. No, so, so my hope is that one could say, so in, 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 some, in some cases, the Oleksandrian Lie complex is a module over the Oleksandrian algebra. And I'm hoping that one can uh, say things about the solubility in that, in that sense. So whether, so when the Oleksandrian algebra is a causal algebra, is the Oleksandrian Lie complex a causal uh, module over the algebra? So that's, that's the question, but I, I don't have a clue about it. I haven't studied it. In your uh, notion of tame arrangement, by arrangement, how important is the coloring? Is it a property of the two arrangements, or does it depend on the coloring? No, it's it's a property of the of the. I mean, the coloring is important. So basically, tame means that, um, roughly speaking, it's something like if you have a, a blue stratum, say, then it has to be contained in some blue light plane that is not contained in any red circuit. That's the rough definition. But tame means that the colors do not mix too much, in a sense. But the funny thing, and I, I really don't understand this sort of miracle, is that most arrangements, most of my arrangements that arise uh, in, in my quest for uh, periods are, are actually tame. So are exactly particular. So you said generic arrangements are tame. Generic that means uh, for some particular choice of coloring or for any reasonable? Uh, so it depends on what you call generic. Sorry. Uh, in, in, in this, when, I wrote, when I wrote the slides, I meant uh, normal crossing arrangements. So very generic. Uh, and for normal crossing arrangements, the, the coloring does not matter. But um, yeah, I could. I guess I could make a statement at some point about uh, generic arrangements in a more, I mean, when, when you have more, uh, when you have more uh, hyperplanes than the dimension, these kinds of things. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I guess, I guess if, if the coloring is not too stupid, it will get, it will give a uh, tame by arrangements. Yeah. So, yeah. Is the uh, total complex always exact? Say, say again? Is the total complex of the Rolex complex exact? Uh, no, almost never. Almost never. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no. There's, there's no way. I mean, if it, it depends. So there's, there's a, a local notion if, if all so if all uh, hyperplanes intersect at, at one point, so for central by arrangement, so to speak, um, so you have a minimal strata, which is the intersection of everyone, and this strata has a color, so let's say it's blue. And if it's blue, it means that all the lines are exact. So the total complex will be exact. But in general, if, you, if you're in a projective space, for instance, um, then you will have minimal strata of all colors, and so you will have Parts of, of this complex with exact lines and parts with exact columns, and it all makes sense. There's, there's no way that the total complex could be exact. Maybe I just one more question. Sure. Uh, if you go from linear arrangements to elliptic or choric arrangements, do you get new periods? Um, well, Well, for elliptic arrangements, for sure, because you will you will get all uh, periods of Kalman's groups of elliptic curves in, in, in your business. For toric arrangements, uh, I really don't know. I really don't know. I haven't thought too much about it. Um, yeah, I don't want to say something wrong. I don't know. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.